Now, Father, we invoke your manifest presence in this room. We invoke and ask for you to release the person of the Holy Spirit in a special way today. Touch hearts, comfort us, heal us, grant, grant joy in the midst of grieving and lamenting. Lord, help us to manage complex emotions. We need your help, Jesus, today. Connect us with you more deeply and with each other. May this day be a day of connection, of love, of celebration, of joy. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you. We welcome you. Amen. Amen, amen. Why don't you just real quick turn and greet somebody. And just we want to welcome all of you that are new here. Just greet the people that are with you. Awesome. I'd like to invite all the elder team to come on up. Elder team, come on up and be with me. <laughs> He's going to fix my jacket. Thank you. It needs fixing. Bob, Diana, come on up. Josh, Amy, come on up. Beautiful. All right. Well, obviously, we have a very special day today to celebrate the life of James Cannon, who we a, a love with all our hearts, and Yenny as well. Uh, but before we do that, we have, we, ha we have to communicate some transitional uh, good news to you all before we do that with, uh, with our celebration. So we want to take a little time. Because today is kind of a special transition day for a lot of us. Yeah. And uh, so uh, those of you who are you know, not a part of our family, we, we think you'll find this next part interesting. All right? But we're only going to take, take a few minutes, and then we'll jump into the, uh, the next part of our time. Okay, so uh, our church family is aware that Janet and I are going on a one-year sabbatical. And that means... Rest, recovery, recreation, renewal, and going deeper in some healing and some growing and maturing. And so we're, we're being uh, blessed and acknowledged uh, and released for, from our church and our rock tribe, our family of churches to do that. And we feel like that is very, very special, not for us, but it's actually going to be a catalytic uh, push or pull or release to our church as well here locally. But we, before we do that, we want to clarify the leadership that will continue into uh, the next years ahead. We felt like it would be important to bring clarity to you so there's a stabilizing and an encouragement. We're moving forward as a family. So uh, Josh and I have been co-senior leaders of Rock Laramie. And we have absolutely, we love each other. We've enjoyed working together. It has been absolutely amazing. To walk with Josh, and because we both want Jesus, and we're not ambitious, and we're not power grab, we we have deferred and submitted to the Christ in each other in a very special way, and that's been the culture of our whole eldership team. We have a collegiality, a team. We have a partnership, so we move we move together on big decisions. We we try to check in and make sure that as much as possible there's consensus. So. What's happening now, because we're going into a new era, I, we wanted to affirm that Josh, along with Amy's amazing partnership, Josh is assuming that role of senior leader in our church. And I couldn't be more honored to communicate that to you. We have an amazing gift in this family. I was just reading something that reflects my heart about Josh, and of course this whole elder team, but in a special way for Josh, because we've, we've known each other 16, 17 years, Josh, and one of the key reasons we're here is because of Josh's sonship heart. He just, he drew us, he drew us to this space, as did Andrew. But here's the verse I have. I have no one else like him. Mm, wow. That's what Paul said. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Wow. Yeah. For everyone looks out for his own interest and not for Jesus Christ. This is not Josh. Yeah, yeah. Josh eats, sleeps, and drinks the kingdom. He loves Jesus with his whole heart. Yeah. And he is, he is passionate about this church family 
being full of the word of God, full of the spirit of God, and learning to heal and mature in love. So all three of those values, revival, restoration, and transformation, the ability to know and live in the word of God, the ability to move by the spirit of God in a revival culture, and the ability to help people mature and grow and become able to do relationships well. That's discipleship in our house. Now, I want to say the hardest one is that one. And Josh and Amy have stepped up in humility and hunger to grow themselves under the, uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit and the pressures that life brings. And so we are honored, I mean honored to have such great and amazing leadership in Josh and Amy and this eldership team. This takes nothing away from Bob or Diana. We feel like there needs to be a, a quote, unquote, first among equals in the sense that someone has to have the point responsibility to, uh, to lead, you know, to take initiative and have the freedom to take the initiative and not be ambiguous about whether they can move this family forward. So we want to really acknowledge that Josh has been handy, handed this baton, of course, with Amy's amazing competency well, as well. Now... We want to add one more thing. We believe Jesus has an extended an invitation to Andrew, Andrew Arnold, to um, co be a co-senior leader with Josh. But at this time, he is considering that. He's praying that through. And however, he, he, if he does accept that role and walks it out, it will be very unique to his other responsibilities as a husband, as a father, and as a leader of executive leader of SHRAM. He will... He won't, don't, you know, don't try to, you know, make Andrew do the kind of things I've been doing because I couldn't do the kind of things he would do. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, now one more thing, acknowledging this eldership, this is the same eldership team yeah. other than Jen and I are taking a break. <laughs> so all of these guys are absolutely powerfully important. Mm -hmm. But here's the key thing I don't want to happen. I want us to celebrate Josh's role and honor him and yield to the Christ in him. I want that. But what also we don't want is for you to default to a traditional legacy church model where there's a senior pastor where he has, does all the work and y'all are consumers. You show up and consume and then you have these high demands on his life and, ex and have high expectations and expect him to meet your needs in a bizarre way, he and Amy, when they have three little children and they're trying to walk out all other things in their life. So this is a day for all of us yeah. to step up into the calling and giftings of God on our lives. Yeah. Get into a J3, get into a kingdom family. Let's grow up, let's bear weight, let's own this vision, let's connect with this family. Let's pour our hearts into what God's calling us to do to bring the kingdom on earth. And so, okay, you got that? We want to fully endorse who Josh is and Amy is to our family. We want to celebrate that. We want to give them full empowerment to be themselves in Christ. At the same time, we're not going to go limp and go passive and, 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 and default to a traditional spectator sport of church life. This is a day for all of us to get promoted. All of us need to step up and get promoted. We all good with that? Okay, awesome. Awesome, that makes me really happy. In a minute, we're going to pray for Josh and Amy, but I wanted to give this team a chance to respond to that first with you, Josh. How is this landing on your heart? How are you feeling? And, uh, and, please, and please stay dressed. Elise, stop undressing your daddy. We're in front of a lot of people right now. Well, hey, man, it's so, this is such a, a joyous moment. I think it's, it's super joyful and a very actually unique situation right here where we have a spiritual father and a spiritual son that have co-labored together along with a team of all of us. I mean, there it truly is a, um, uh, a shared leadership here, um, but to also to have the opportunity to send Tim and Janet with blessing and cleanness and and, and hope on a, a year-long sabbatical to finish 10 years well, right? And to finish this fourth quarter um, it, it with, with excellence and uh, start the fourth quarter. There we go. So, 
and 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 so so it's just it's just a beautiful situation and i think you know i don't have a lot to say we are looking forward to the future it's a hopeful future like we are a resurrected life people and we are committed to everybody here in this church family of leading a family that lives out the resurrected life of jesus christ and we're going to live on the resurrected side of the cross And we want to see everybody come into the full manifestation of who Jesus made you to be at the cross. And that's who we are. So we want to come low. We want to come underneath just like Jesus did. We want to be servant leaders. And and we're looking forward to the hopeful future. Um, Amy and I are excited about this. Andrew and Jess are excited about this. Bob and Diana, we're so excited about this. And David and Narelle are excited about this. They're not with us right now, but they are huge support for this elder team. And um, they're a huge support for this church family in us moving forward and seeing a harvest and Jesus getting his glory. Awesome, Josh. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think we're just, uh, we are really excited for uh, Tim and Janet in the season. So I don't want to be repetitive. But it's a gift. Um, and we love you all, and we're, we're really going to be with you in spirit, yeah. praying for you all. We're going to miss you. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I think as we've just talked as an elder team, I think we're really excited to see how Jesus is going to move to equip, to strengthen, to empower, to um, invite us all into deeper life with him and deeper life with one another. Yeah. It's really, I think, an invitation for Jesus to, or I, I, we sense that Jesus is inviting us to like experience him in deeper places of belonging and love than we haven't personally and we haven't corporately. Mm-hmm. And that's going to cause our heart for him to grow. Yeah. It's going to cause our heart for one another to grow. And as we do, we'll mature. We'll, we'll deepen in Christ. We'll yeah. deepen in, in love. love and, that. and that is really exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to be part of I desire to be a part of that. Yeah. I desire to raise up a family that deeply loves Jesus, that has this deep sense of belonging with Jesus, and this deep sense of belonging to one another, where we're known, and we get to, we know, and we are known in Jesus and one another. That is inspiring. I want to move towards that. I want to lay down my life for that. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite you into that with Jesus. So that's my heart. So I'd like to just take a minute, and as a representative of you guys, I'd like to pray over Josh and Amy right now, and Janet, come on up here. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you guys, let's just let's just do that. Would you extend your hands to Josh and Amy? And uh, they've already been set in, but it's just a confirmation. So, Father, we want to say thank you for Josh and Amy. Yes, amen. And the amazing love they have for you and for this family, and we're asking, Lord, that you would unleash a level of grace commensurate to this mandate, yes, this calling, which is absolutely supernatural. So we do pray, Lord, for the fruit of the Spirit, all of it. They would love like Jesus. And they would walk in the shalom and the peace of Jesus, full of faith with no anxiety and no, and no sense of performance, uh, dema- uh, performance pressure. Lord, I ask that the wisdom and revelation of the Spirit be on them. Lord, that they would see things, know things that come from heaven. They would be guided by heaven's voice, Mm -hmm. by the voice of Jesus. We're a Jesus-led family. And we pray for the power of the Spirit. Absolutely, the power of the Spirit to be witnesses and to animate and mobilize Mm -hmm. disciples that make disciples, that we're a disciple-making church empowered by the person of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now we just pray for this elder team. We pray for Bob and Diana. We pray for Andrew and Jess, Josh and Amy, that they would hold the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. They would grow deeper in love with each other and as well as the crab trees. And we just pray for a new era and a new chapter of fruitfulness in this family in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Beautiful. (laughs) All right, that's kind of fun. All right, we're going to take our offering after that. So you get a chance to demonstrate your partnership with this church and the vision of this church. So we're going to pass the hat around, the hat. And And we just want to, we just want to, we had an opportunity during tribal to pray over Tim and Janet. We're just going to quickly, as the offering gets passed around, ask you to extend your hands to them. And we just, this is their last Sunday with us for a year. So August 1st, they're kicking it off officially. But, yeah, we just want to gather around them just well, 
Um, so as we pray for Tim and Jana, I just feel like the Holy Spirit was leading me. You know, we're here to bless them and not experience loss, but more like a launching into what the Lord has for them during this year of sabbatical. And how it ties into James is James, as you, I don't want to steal anybody's, like, the thunder of his memorial, but he came here to call people higher. There isn't an individual in this room, whether you worked with him or sat in this room with him, that he wasn't calling each and every one of us to God's high, like, his best. And so we just want to pray for your best and that also, you know, then we're all, Josh and Amy, Andrew and I, and all of you, you know, Bob and Diana, and all of you being called to your best, Amen. you know, to that throne room. Amen. So. Amen. Yes. Father, we just right now thank you for Tim and Janet. And we send them with a blessing and we release them with a blessing to go and lock eyes with Jesus, to lay aside ministry life and pick up Jesus life. And we just pray right now. I pray for that, that window of grace that Paul had when he locked eyes with you and then he went into seclusion and you tutored him in grace. You tutored him in, in, in the truth of the scriptures. You tutored him in kingdom life and the family, uh, family life, the, the bridal life of uh, being a lover of you, of being sons and daughters of God. And we uh, bless them and we release them right now in Jesus' name to lock eyes with Jesus, lay aside ministry, build your marriage, build intimacy with, with Christ, and, and, and be oaks of righteousness in Jesus' name. A planting of the Lord for the day of his splendor. And we declare that over you. A season of growing into becoming oaks of righteousness in Jesus' name. Well, wonderful. We want to transition. That, and, and I think you sense the, the timing of that was important because Tim and Janet leave for their sabbatical this week. So now we're going to transition because we really want to this morning to be a time where we honor and we celebrate and we remember and we also mourn the, the passing of James and we honor and celebrate the life that he lived this morning. And so uh, I just want to open us with prayer. I know we've been praying a lot this morning, but Jesus, we want to give you this time. We, we, we thank you that you're here with us, Jesus, and that we're not alone um, as we mourn and grieve and as we celebrate and honor that you're here with us. And, and as Tim prayed, we just invite you, well, you're here, we invite our hearts, we, we invite our hearts deeper to experience your presence here right now as we uh, honor James. And um, we just thank you. We thank you for his life. Actually, I'm, th I'm thankful that you, James, you're in heaven now as that great cloud of witness. You're leaning over the balcony of heaven and you're cheering us on. And that brings me some comfort. And so uh, we're thankful for this time and, and we give it to you now, Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. Adam and Mary, you can come on up. and We're going to lead out in our song here in just a minute. Uh, we want to welcome all of you that are uh, tuning in live in our live streaming, those of you in Denmark and in Africa and around the country. We want to greet you and tell you how much we love you and uh, how appreciative we are for the part you played in James's life. So you are, we are uh, welcoming you to, cons to be a part of this experience today as well. So we're recording this for those that can't watch or be here so they can watch it later, right? We've got the recording going, everybody. Okay, good. I'm getting heads nodded. All right, so um, one of the, th the key features we want to have happen here today is a dynamic in the scripture called impartation. Uh, the Lord puts nu DNA nutrients in individual people, and those, those attributes of Christ 
if we open our hearts to them and honor them and receive and humble ourselves, those attributes can slide into us by osmosis in a very mystical way. We can draw on the life of Christ in another by connecting to them and recognizing that that Christ in them that got manifested can get into us. And there's a lot of things about Jesus, a lot of Jesus in James. So we want you to really uh, acknowledge a transaction could happen today, that something special, a gift from God could happen to you. And that's one of the main reasons we want to celebrate this, other than that we loved him. <laughs> we like him. And we're, uh, we're so honored that he, God gave us, him to us. So I'm going to again pray. And I'm going to ask for, in this next hour, a transaction takes place where you receive something very special that changes your life through the life that he lived. So, Father, thank you for James. Thank you for, for Yenny. Thank you for sending him here to this uh, Laradice place to be a part of a move of your spirit across the earth. Thank you for their missional heart. Thank you that you set them up with such amazing resource and gift. And so today, Lord, we're asking for a supernaturally empowered atmosphere, a supernatural atmosphere of impartation where we get elevated to think about our lives in a fresh way. We want to think about eternity. We want to think about who we are and what we're called to. So we ask for a special release of revelation from your spirit that comes through the life of James Cannon. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Let's, let's, um, I'm going to ask you to stand just because it's good for our bodies. And I'd like you to breathe. And then just let your spirit flow with this song. It's really a beautiful song. And it's a song Yenny chose for today.
appreciate that. You can be seated. So this morning, um, I'm going to share a little bit, and then uh, we're going to have some people that were close to James um, come up to uh, celebrate, honor, remember his life. And then there will be an opportunity for, um, I guess, open mic, spontaneous um, sharing about James. And then afterwards, we're going to hear from Yenny um, as she just uh, eulogizes and remembers his life. So I say that because if there is something that you is on your heart that you would like to come to honor, remember, celebrate about James, we want to. There will be space and time for that as uh, as we just go throughout this morning. Thought that would be important. So um, when Yenny asked me to just uh, kind of help MC and share a little bit, I felt very honored. Um, and she was sharing just a little bit about James' life. And I didn't know this until recently, but he loved lighthouses. So we got this beautiful piece here. And Yenny says that all around their home are lighthouses that she and James would collect. Because lighthouses were a very important and meaningful symbol and metaphor for James. Now, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but I do know that he lived a lot of his life on the ocean, in the sea, like the open ocean. So if you live your life on the ocean, lighthouses are going to be meaningful because um, they keep you safe, they direct, they guide. Um, but they, I think also it, it just really is this beautiful prophetic symbol of who James was as a person and what James cared about and the things that mattered to James um, about Christ and Christ's kingdom and, and, and people and the people of God. So I thought that was really meaningful. So two days after James passed away, Bob Seebeck said, I'm, I'm going to draw a painting of a lighthouse to honor and remember and, and potentially process that loss for himself. I don't know. I'm, I don't want to speak for you, Bob. But he did this in two days. I think that's really incredible. He just, he said, I, this, yeah, if you haven't had a chance to see it, um, c- please come up afterwards. But I think this is just such a beautiful um, picture of a lighthouse that we can use to kind of anchor just our time this morning to remember and honor James. I love it. And so I want to use this as a little bit of uh, uh, the bridge to just talking about and sharing about James. I was, one thing that I loved about James, and I think this will resonate with a lot of you that knew James well, and I couldn't figure out how to weave it in the lighthouse. So I'm going to start with this, but it doesn't really work for this metaphor. Um, Yeah, so it's like, I thought I love James's humor and his sense of humor. I just don't know how you make the lighthouse metaphor work with humor. Um, so if you got an idea, share that with me later. But I want to start with that because the thing, the thing about, I loved about James, I loved his smile. You know, he had that great, it's like you couldn't forget James's smile. You know, and, and um, you know when he smiled at you, it kind of would light up your heart. You know, you really felt like, wow, he has such joy. And he, he seems to really just enjoy being with me right now. And that was a beautiful, uh, just part of who James was. And his smile and then his laughter and, and just his sense of humor. He just knew how to be serious but have fun at the same time. And as someone who, I just, I, I admired that. And I think what I loved about that, about James, it was, a, it was really a bridge into your heart. You know, it was a way by which he could connect with you. And you felt you felt known, you felt loved, you felt seen, and you wanted to move towards him. But I think it was really Christ in him that you were wanting to move towards. So that was really meaningful. So now, with the, with the lighthouse metaphor, one thing, when I, when, I th- when I see this lighthouse, when I see this picture, when I think about a lighthouse, I think of strength. And James had this amazing both external and internal strength as, as a person, as a man, as a husband, as a friend, uh, a lover of people, a lover of Jesus. And lighthouses, they just endure a lot. They're, they're literally set on the edge of these rocks, and they endure storms, they endure hardships, they endure challenge, adversity, and they're strong and resilient. And I'll be honest, I didn't know James that well in terms of like a lifetime of knowing him, but there was something about him when you were around him, you're like, I just know that he is strong and he provides a strength to those around him. And when I hear stories about him being a missionary, when I hear stories about him being a a sailor, for lack of a better word, a man on a ship at the ocean, and just the way he lived his life, it was just strength. 
it, but it wasn't just strength of, 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 of physical body. It was a strength of the spirit. His love for Jesus, a strength of the soul, strength of the mind, strength of the heart, and a strength of the body. So I love that. And also, with the lighthouse, something that I deeply, personally love, and I think this will resonate with others about James, is the lighthouse has the capacity, has the ability to help you locate where you are. You know, it's like if you're out in the open ocean and you see a lighthouse and you know maps, you know how to read maps and, and, you're, and you're good at the sea, then you know, oh, this lighthouse tells me where I'm at on the open ocean. It's a, it's a way by which you can locate yourself. And I think James had this incredible capacity to see people by the Spirit and prophetically call them forward. I say, I see you. I actually can help you by the Spirit locate, so to speak, who you are and where you're at. And I can call that forward. I can call that out in you and inspire you to, to deepen your identity in Jesus, to deepen where you are in Christ, and then live out of that place. And I love that about James. So he's, in a sense, he like helped people. He helped me anyway. I don't know about you. But he helped me locate, so to speak, who I am or where I'm at in life and call me forward, call me out, call me upwards into Christ. And I thought that was super meaningful. It was one of the things that really, really impacted me about James. It's like I felt seen by Christ because of his words, because of his affirmation, because of who he saw me to be by the Spirit. And so um, it was almost like, oh, that's who I am. That's who I, God's calling me to be. And it brought safety. I mean, a light, when you know where you're at and you can locate where you're at on the open sea, it provides safety to your soul, safety to your ship, literally. But in some ways, it was like Christ providing safety to my soul through James. And I thought that was really, really Im impactful for me personally. And I think also with a lighthouse, obviously it's a light. Um, so that seems redundant. But um, James was a light. James was a light for Christ. He, if you were around James, you knew, you were like, I've been with Jesus. His light did not dim or he did not put it under a bush. Um, he lived from the heart in an authentic way. It wasn't phony. That's what I love about James. It was never phony. It was never churchy. It was real and authentic. The light that would come out of his spirit, his eyes, his heart was amazing. And he reflected the light of Jesus to me. And I saw him do it with everybody else that he would encounter and influence. So he was a light. He was the light of Christ. He was a light for Jesus on a hill. And he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't ashamed. Um, he's like, this is who I am. And, um, and, and it drew me in. It drew me to want to be more like Jesus. And I imagine it did for a lot of other, if not everybody in this room and those watching. So I love James' uh, light, the light of Christ, the light of Jesus that uh, he just said, hey, this is, this is where I'm at. This is who I am. This is who Jesus is. And, um, and lastly, I think, obviously, a lighthouse is just a place of safety, or it creates safety. And I think James is a man who um, invited us into, like, deeper places of safety in Christ, that Jesus is safe in the sense of, like, Jesus is He's not dangerous, but Jesus is a safe harbor, so to speak. He's a place of safety, and we can trust Jesus. That's it. He, we can trust Jesus. We can walk with Jesus. We can move towards the kingdom and live like Jesus, and we'll be safe in the sense of, like, our lives will be protected and in Christ. And that uh, was really hopeful for me. So I think the last thing I'll share about that that I really uh, was inspired by James was that, play, that sense of hope. Like, he invited, he, he, he was like a lighthouse, James, um, was a place of hope. That is to say, like, it, it, it um, what I mean by that is, um, if you are, I can imagine if you're a sailor lost at sea and just floating on the oceans in the midst of a storm, if you saw a lighthouse, there was hope that, okay, I can be found or I know where I'm at and I know where I can go. I know where I'm headed, so to speak, to avoid danger. And I think uh, James really was that place of, like, safety. J Christ in James, I think, provided a lot of safety and, and, like, gave people hope for where they could go or where God was leading them. And that really meant a lot to me. 
And then lastly, and again, the metaphor doesn't work, but James is a huge encouragement. I mean, if you ever were around James, you felt encouraged. You just felt inspired. You felt like you could, like, run through a brick wall, climb the highest tower. Um, you were like, I am, I'm literally, I feel like a superhero right now. You know, it's like, I, I, what's that? And beautiful. Yeah, James did often compliment me on my beauty <laughs> and my good looks, which I appreciated. No, I mean, you literally could feel like I could literally climb, I mean, I am a Marvel superhero, but it was never phony. It was like, this is who you are in Christ. Now go advance the kingdom. Go live this out. And it was like unbelievable. So James, I love you, bro. I appreciate you. I know you're watching us now and cheering us on, and I'm so thankful for him. So what a, what a gift. All right, so we're going to hear from three people next. And... Um, I'm going to go off the order that I have here. So I'd like to first invite um, one of James's lifelong, long-term friends. I may be lifelong, but I know very, knew him very long, and that is Brian Sumption. Brian Sumption. So we're going to hear from Brian. Come on up, Brian. Yeah, we welcome you. Welcome, brother. Good morning. My wife, Connie, and I. Came from Aberdeen, South Dakota. Maybe some of you will struggle to get through your time too. <laughs> we have a relationship with the Johns family. Some of you may not know that, but uh, we met Tim and Janet in 1986. And then in 89 or 88, he moved up to uh, Richland Center, Wisconsin. Maybe it was late 87, but anyhow, um, they built a new church up there and invited my wife and, at that time, two children to come to Richland Center for the dedication. And while they're there, you know, we'd only driven a 1,000 miles to get there. <laughs> um, Tim says, hey, yeah, you know, you're welcome to come. We'd like to invite you to come. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's a great thought. But it doesn't really matter what I think. <laughs> Going to have to talk to the boss. So we had breakfast with Tim before we left town. So Tim could make his formal pitch to Connie. And, <laughs> and I really honestly thought, well, that'll be the end of that. On the way out to the car, she goes, you know, I think that was the Lord. <laughs> it's like, seriously? And 45 days later, that 1,000 miles was nothing, and we're living in Richland Center. So about a year and a half passed, and uh, Tim deserted me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Went back to... Uh, the Lord had actually told me Tim was leaving, and I went to him. I says, Tim, the Lord tells me you're leaving. He goes, why do you say that? I said, well, it's not so much about you leaving. I just would like to move into your house when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Richland Center has a common real estate market to Laramie. It's hard to find a place to live. So anyhow, shortly after we moved into 813 North Church Street, I was driving to church early one Sunday morning, and I saw this guy with a full-length coke walking, and so I stopped, and I said, hey, you need a ride somewhere? And that was James Cannon. <laughs> and so that was uh, late fall of 89. And so basically from then, James became a part of our family. Amen. Good morning, Rob Lindsay, another one of our good friends from Kansas and Richland Center. A few of us made it here to see him. Uh, anyhow... So other than James's sisters, I just met Prudence. I haven't met your other sister and Mr. Davis. I know, is Norm your dad? Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, other than his sisters, we probably have known James the longest of anyone here. And so anyhow, um, my hope in these few moments that I share would be to kind of demystify some of the secret sauce that you got from James when you had interactions with him. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, Tim said that there's this DNA. Well, the way it gets worded for me is Revelations 12, 11. It says that they overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And where, what's a testimony? Well, Graham Cook defines a testimony as who is God to me. It's a personal experience, and it's not just one. It's experiences we have. And there is something in DNA. It's a, it's a tangible impartation. And 
Jesus taught in Matthew 10 that freely we receive and freely we can give. Well, when we have these exchanges with him, we actually possess something we can give away. And I would submit to you, first of all, that each of you that had your special exchanges with James, you might not have been able to describe it, but what you felt was a tangible impartation of an experience that he had had. And if you will lay a hold of it, you might not have laid a hold of it, but it's available. And if you choose to lay a hold of that experience, you can have the same experience that he had. And so, first and foremost, he had a lot of little things like that. So some of those things that I would submit to you, James uh, was not born with a Tim John's brain. And he, ne he never acted like he was. He, you know, Tim's been very gifted and very blessed, and we're grateful that he has been blessed. But James had a heart like Secretariat. Oh, yeah. You know, a normal heart's about eight pounds. They cut Secretariat open, and his heart was 22 pounds. And so uh, that, to me, in the spirit, is James. He had a bigger heart than most people. And so James was a simple person. And... Um, I think we're, our relationship, uh, we're very opposite. James is an outside person, and I'm an inside person. James picked up very quickly that when it comes to mechanics, it's the grace of God. I know where to stick the key to start the car. <laughs> and, and, and so, anyhow, he's very gracious to me because I had things that needed to be fixed, and he was gracious enough to fix them. And so... Anyhow, I believe that one of James's secret sauces is there's lots of things that happened in his life that just didn't make sense to him. A lot of emotion, a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration until he started to realize my father always acts in my best interest. And I might not know it. I might not know what's going on, but I trust that he's always acting. And along with that, around 2005 or 6, might have the year, years off a little bit, on the mission field, he meets somebody named Yenny. <laughs> and then he finds out that there's another person who always acts in my best interest. And when everything's said and done, you know, James is just like the rest of us. He's fully capable of succumbing to any types of trouble that presents itself to us. But Yenny was like an anchor for him. And even though she might not have thought the way he thought, spoke the way he wanted her to speak, and done it the way he necessarily wanted it done, he realized that she always acted in his best interest. And that was a big anchor to his soul. And I hope you know that isn't patronization. <laughs> so... Anyhow, a couple of other things about James. James never talked about his upbringing much. I think a lot of it had to do with the pain. But he had a stepdad, evidently, who wanted James to detail his car. And he wanted it so clean that he inspected it with a Q-tip. I don't know. Some people might think that's funny. He was serious, and that was the level of cleanliness that James was re required to clean that car. And so, as a result of that, any of you who worked with James on a project, James, in his heart, was, did I do a good job? And there's lots of things I would like to say, but I'm going to conclude with this one. The day before we came was walking and the Lord interrupted my thoughts and he started to tell me what the last moments of James's life was like <laughs> and evidently they just finished a job and the question was do you think we did a good job and the Lord says to me I'm going to go answer that question in person and I'm going to tell him and he did well done James you're my good and faithful servant and I'm going to that for now. Thank you.
Thank you, Brian. All right, next we're gonna hear from Bob Seebeck. And also, there are tissues up here. Um, and there's a round, so yeah, thanks, Bob. Unlike these guys, I couldn't uh, keep this all in my head, so I had to write notes. Excuse me. Um, I do, Yanni, it's, it's good to see you. Um, it's a blessing for me to finally meet Brian. I've heard. <laughs> I had it like <laughs> I feel I know you really well in the two in the two sisters because I've heard so much about you so I want to say it's a joy to meet you Bob uh, we had the the privilege of knowing James and Yenny uh, because they just lived two doors down from us and I saw James <laughs> A lot, if not every day. <laughs> That's why I needed this thing. You need one hand for this, one hand for this. I don't have three. <laughs> so I'd never met a follower of Jesus like James. Never. Uh, uh, to listen to Andrew talk, uh, I just kept saying, well, I can sit down because he said everything that I have to say with a great deal of detail. What I did, I was trying to save time and I, and I just picked out high points. Uh, but, but Andrew, just he just embellished it. I, I paint that way. I, I paint big general areas uh, because I don't like to get in there and pick on the detail. I, I like to get the, the main gist of an image. So, but for me to describe James, I, I, I think of him of the great joy he had, and, and that joy really came from, from, the, from Jesus, from knowing the Lord, and, and a joy from, from having had a lot of victories in his life. There was a joy and a, and, and a peace that, that James had, and I, and I believe that that is a, a great witness because of Jesus. Um, I, he was a man, the, the James I knew, of great patience and gentleness. Um, he wasn't trying to, to uh, tell me who he was because James always came in low. And that's, that's, that's something I heard him say so many times uh, because, because there's, there's, he said, how do you refer to that as a big blade trying to take out leaders? And he says, so you want to come in low. Um, he, he, he had an incredible faith that, that encouraged me. And with all that he was, there was a meekness and uh, not, not a shyness, but a meekness. He knew who he was, and he didn't have to tell me who he was. Uh, I just so admired that, and that was a witness of his self-control. Um, and all of that comes from, from the Christ that he knew personally and that he walked with. Uh, he was also one of the most honest men I'd ever met, and the humblest, but also a man who was 100% committed to, as he would say, Papa God. And, and we talked about Papa God a lot. He had an amazing work ethic that just blew me away, just almost equal to yours, Chris. So, <laughs> but uh, and all of these descriptions, I, I think, line up with, with uh, Galatians 5. You know, those are the fruits of the Spirit. And, and that's what the, the James I knew he was a walking exhibit of Galatians 5. Um, any time that, as you had said, any time that he, when he spoke to people, he, he encouraged, he brought out the best. He called us up to a higher, a higher, a higher place, uh, called us into our true self. And that's what I just loved about him. James touched so many people in his brief time here in Laramie. Whether you go to Napa or Riley or any shop, uh, he, he met people, and, and people, they, 
they just didn't forget this man who seemed to read their mail and get in touch with him. Uh, I think for James, he loved the person that was in front of him. And that was, was such a beautiful gift of his. As an engineer, you know, he, and, and he told me lots of stories about keeping those fishing trawlers moving on the ocean. And, and how, I mean, he, he had to keep them going. And it's not you could run across the street to Ace. He had to figure out how to fix this stuff and keep them going. Because if the ship broke down, they couldn't fish. And that freezer full of fish went to stinking. And this was the man. He, he could do that. That's what he did. But as he was this, this man, an engineer, he could fix anything. And Travis could tell us a lot of things he fixed for Travis. But what was amazing, when, when I, I did projects with, with James, I would say, he'd say, well, Bob, how do you want to fix this? What do you want to do here? And, and, I, and I'd kind of look at him because I knew he's an engineer. He's already got it figured out. He didn't have to ask me. But he, he had the, the self-control and the gentleness to say, what's your opinion? And I just, I really miss that about him. Um, Again, back to the lighthouses. I, I found out after he passed that, that lighthouses meant, meant a lot to him, and so I did this painting for him. And, and, and again, it made me think, as, as Andrew has always pointed out, already pointed out, you know, it's a light. It's a beacon out there when, in the storm. Here's that light. It's also a place of safety, and it's also a marking, a place of great uh, peril and danger. But then how does that, again, relate to James? James was always that beacon of light and of truth. And no matter whoever he met, he, that light came on and he'd call us up. He'd call us up and he'd call us out. And that's, that's why I think this, this is very significant, a representation of my friend James. And Yenny has that same, same ability. Um, for me... I don't want to forget this a living, living example that I have of James, of a, Christ, of a life well lived in Christ. The nine months that I had with him as a friend touched me deeply, obviously. <laughs> he overcame many difficulties in his early life. We, we talked a lot. Yet I am here to celebrate the life of a man that was way too short, but well lived in Christ. Well lived in Christ, along with so many. I miss my friend James. Diane and I really had the privilege of, of uh, spending much time with him. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Bob. Wow, isn't that painting just absolutely remarkable? Wow, that's a Seebeck original. And after you die, Bob, that's going to be worth a lot of money. I'm telling you what. You know how that goes, an artist isn't famous, or an artist isn't expensive until he, never mind, you know. So I had the, the deep honor of being one of James's spiritual dads. Uh, I got a call from a very close friend of ours from up in Richland Center after we had started our inner city church. And Janet and I were uh, hanging out in the inner city. We had bought a convent, and we turned it into a discipleship house. I mean, everybody should own a convent. <laughs> and Mother Superior and I went, got into the convent there. And I got a call from a friend in Richland Center. He said, I've got this guy named James Cannon who I just love, who, who is... Um, breaking out into his true self. He needs to experience sonship and a spiritual daddy. He needs to, he needs to uh, have something, a revelation of this settle into his spirit. Would you be open to having him move to Kansas City, into the inner city, into the convent, and uh, be a part of the family down there? And I said, I trust you, Dick. Send him. So in comes James. In comes James. And I made it a point to hang out with him just to pick up on and read his spirit, just discern where, where, where are we at to diagnostically pick up how do I serve this man? And so uh, just listened to his heart, worked with him, 
And then I, and then I started asking him to do really hard, grungy, dirty, unglamorous jobs. Because that's how you kind of begin to drill down into what's the motivation. What's the, will he do a mundane, hard job with a good attitude? So I'd give him a, you know, like, let's clean the toilets. Let's, uh, let's, let's do this job. Let's fix this thing. Let's clean out this, uh, you know, closet. And not a peep out of him. In fact, he really, the dirtier it was, the more he liked it. And he, without complaint, I mean, he was just like, because in his mind, this was worship. I get to, I get to do this grungy stuff um, with Tim, and together we get to do the kingdom practically in the dirt. And I'm like, whoa, I've never run across somebody that would work long hours without complaining, and then I would ask him to do things alone. I wanted to see how he would handle Rout routine hard jobs uh, without anybody watching or thanking him. Just what do you do when you're not appreciated and you got hard jobs to do? Again, pass the test beyond what I could have ever pulled off because, you know, I like an attaboy now and then. He didn't care. He didn't care. He was like, okay, um, because he was doing it to the Lord. He's doing it under the Lord. And so the more I picked up on his servant heart and this meekness about him, this humility about him, and this hunger about uh, James. I'm like, who, what manner of man are you? So I began to pull in that servant meekness, simplicity. I could see that he liked the simple side of the kingdom, the practical side of the kingdom. And I was in the vision side of the kingdom. I was into the, you know, let's change the world and let's, you know, let's plant churches all over the world and let's get it done next week. You know, and James is, you know, let's pull the weeds in the garden today and uh, let's do that for Jesus. And I'm totally opposite of the spectrum. And I needed James just as much as James needed me. Like I needed to get in the dirt. I needed to get into the practicals the day-to-day -day rhythms, and celebrate those as every bit as big as a big vision thing. So I picked up that nutrient, that meekness in James, and uh, that not, no need to be a leader, no need to have a voice, no, no need to have uh, accolades, just give me a hard job and turn me loose. And, you know, and, I'll, and that will be health, that will be good for the Lord. That will be good. I mean, and then he would always say, Tim, I'm just here to serve Jesus and serve you. Just here to serve Jesus and serve you. And I'm like, I don't think I've ever had anybody talk to me like this. Nobody shows up and says, how can I serve Jesus and you? Just give me a job and turn me loose. Like, who joins a church with that in mind? I came, he came to give. He didn't actually come to receive other than he wanted to belong. He wanted to belong to a family. He wanted to be a spiritual son. He wanted to understand family because that was a rough part of his life. But in terms of anything else, that didn't matter. His role, his position, his status, his voice, none of that. He just came in low, slow, and kind and meek. All right, so it was a number of months that I watched this, and I was in total awe. And then he came to me and he said, you know, I have this longing to just serve orphans in Africa. And I'm like, orphans in Africa? He goes, do you think you could help me be a missionary in Africa? Because he had been working with our inner city kids. And I watched his love for children. And he said, you know, like, isn't this enough? Isn't inner city kids like, isn't this like a good enough Africa for you? He goes, no. I need to go to Africa. I feel the Holy Spirit telling me to go to Africa. Okay, so it's so, so, it's so uh, you know, it was in my life I have had friendship with uh, Heidi and Roland Baker, who are the heads of Iris Ministries, the founders of Iris Ministries, and pretty established, amazing couple. And we've had them in our home. We've had them at tribal gatherings. And so I, got it, I called R Roland, and I said, I got this guy. <laughs> he wants to come to Africa. He wants to serve orphans and widows and do practical stuff. He can fix anything. He can fix anything. 
If anything breaks down, and I could hear Rawling start to pant. Because <sighs> cars and trucks are always blowing up in Africa. There's no, you know, you're always using duct tape and bailing wire. You always, I mean, it's terrible. And so I could hear him hyperventilating on the other, like he can turn a wrench and fix an engine and change a tire. I said, oh, yeah, that's nothing. And he loves children. <laughs> he loves children. I said, yeah, he'll do anything. So send him over. Send him over as soon as you can. So we get the resources. We send him to Africa. <laughs> and uh, James lands and sure to form he performed exactly like he did in the inner city. I mean, low, slow, meek. He submitted his will to the will of another, broken and humble. Whatever needs to happen, I'll just do it. I'm happy with that. If this is the need of the hour, even if the leader said, you know, we got to go do this, he would trust that. He would say, like, okay, if that's what we need to do, then that's what we need to do. And it, you know, sometimes doesn't make sense. When a leader sees, if we, if we don't do this, then we won't get to here. So he trusted Rollin. He says, I, you know, we just got to do that. So the next thing I know, you know, their normal protocol is someone shows up, they test drive them, then they send them home to determine if they really want to come back. They have to raise support, and it takes quite a long time to do that, a year to raise support, and test the waters to see if you want to come back and suffer for Jesus in that environment. He was so valuable to the ministry, they said, forget that protocol. We'll pay your salary. Please stay. Please stay. We can't, we can't do this without you. You've become so invaluable in these practical areas. We need you to stick around. And so that's when he, he did that. And he became, he championed. They basically then, his gifts made room for himself. And he, he you know, he just kept, kept serving his way into management. But he never wanted to be a manager. He preferred to be a servant, but he was such a good server, and, a, and he liked people so well, he could manage practical things. You get my point? So he was in Africa 11 years, and the best thing that ever happened to him was Yenny. And he talked a lot about Yenny. He, his whole face and countenance would change when he talked about Yenny. And he was the light of his life, the, the focal point of his heart. It was always about Yenny. And in some bizarre, weird way, in the last couple of years, he began to discern he was supposed to move here in, into this tribe, which this has been kind of a hub of the Rock, of Rock Tribe, a family of churches around the country. We still have our inner city church in Kansas City. But he felt like he needed to come here and serve Janet and I, Yenny and him, they came to a tribal last year, a big family gathering, and they said, the Lord told us to move here. What do you want to move here for, James? Thinking, you know, most people's answer is, so I can get this and I can get that, and you can help me here and help me there and help me get my ministry. And he said, whatever you need, whatever you need. And I'm like, whatever we need, like what if it means we need windows replaced in this building? Psst, no problem. I'll work with these guys and do that. What if we need this? What if we need that? I don't care. Whatever it is, Tim. And he got here, and no sooner that he got here and got his stuff set up, he started serving. He started loving. And that's when I began uh, proposing to them that they move in and begin to operate as spiritual parents and pick up the, op the possibility of leading a kingdom family, a small little house church here. Because they have so much pastoral love in their heart, so much mothering and daddy love in their spirit. So, um, and, that, and they agreed to do that, and we launched one. We've launched a kingdom family together with Yenny, and then James had the audacity to fly away out there in one of the most beautiful places in the world. He, he got escorted by angels. Um... And we did get a chance to pray over his body for God to raise him up. And that did not happen, much to my real mega disappointment. Um, so here we are now. What is it that um, I'm hoping that will deepen in my life and will deepen in your life? What, what is this DNA, this, what is this mystical transaction? Here's, here's what I hope it is. 
is that we, we love Jesus so well that we're in the moment, we're in the present, and we do whatever it takes to just serve people well. Now, here's the other unusual attribute about James that accompanied his practical serving. He had a spiritual connection to the person of the Holy Spirit in an ongoing way, in an unbroken communion with the Holy Spirit. So he was a mystic who did practical stuff. Where do you get that? Where do you get somebody that has dreams, visions, and words of the Lord? And so he would walk into this room. I watched him do it every single time. Bar none, he would walk around, and he would like, mm -hmm. he'd pick up on the Spirit. So he'd pick up the trash, and then he'd pick up on the Holy Spirit. And he'd, he'd get in front of you, and he would see you by the Spirit. And he'd go, the Lord is telling me this is how he views you. This is how he sees you. This is how you're known in heaven. This is how you're known in heaven. And he would literally squeegee people off from all the lies of hell that had hit them that week. All the attempts to build strongholds, to create insecurities in their life, um, he would undo it with the word of the Lord. He did it to me many times. And I'm like, I almost got embarrassed because, because what he would say was so glowing and elevated. And I thought, certainly you're not talking about me because I know my weaknesses. I know my failures. I know what I'm not. And he goes, the focus isn't what you're not. The focus is where God's taking you. You've got to see yourself by the Spirit, Tim, and act like how God sees you. He would do that to a person. He would walk around and just love them and smile at them and communicate the heart of the Lord and then go fix something. Because normally mystics can't pick up a wrench and normally people that, can't, that pick up a wrench can't hear the Lord. You get my point? That's a word picture. That's an analogy. So finally, I'm going to end with this. Um, uh, I'm trying to sell a car so I can buy a truck. Because I, I think I need a truck at 70 years old to complete my manhood. I live in Wyoming, I live in Wyoming right? Okay. So, no, I tell all the guys here, a real man drives a minivan. Because nothing <laughs> speaks of manhood like a minivan. Responsibility. Okay, never mind. Anyway, my battery went dead in this in this car, in this Tahoe, and and I'm like, I am so packed up to here with stuff to do, and you know, I'm I'm calling I'm calling. Uh, I don't have all the tools because I gave them away, and 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 it's like so. Finally, I'm thinking, what do I do? And it's like, call James. So I called James. I said, James, I need a battery. Can you can you can you fix my car and so I can sell it and he goes well if you, only if you sell it in Fort Collins will you get enough more money than you'll get here he goes I'll change it if you sell it and get all the money you can get out of it I said well maybe I can't promise that but so that guy took my car went and bought the right battery took out the old one fixed up the new one and put a new battery in his car well later I'm like you know I'm, I've been taught over the years that sometimes physical things speak of spiritual realities, right? You know, you got to pay attention to the natural because the natural often speaks of the spiritual. And I'm like, that's the really the only thing I ever asked James to do for me personally was change my battery. <laughs> then I started losing it. James came here to change my battery. Like, I'm exhausted. After 50 years of just night and day availability and on call. And every time I got with James, my, I could feel my battery get recharged. And, and all of a sudden I realized that was one of his assignments to take this exhausted old fart, old man. <laughs> that means old man in English for all you Danish people. <laughs> Don't go there. And, and to breathe life into my spirit because there was a level of depletion that was dangerous, a dangerous level of dep depletion. And he did that for me. He renewed and restored. He helped to restore. He was the conduit that put fire back in my spirit, man. He changed my battery. So 
we felt like there was such a significance about this man's life that we had to, we had to carve out this time on Sunday and do church around this because there's something deep. I want to pray for an impartation. Then we're going to have Andrew come up, and we're going to have some other sharing uh, out of your heart if you feel so led. But put your hands out, and, and, and really, it's called the laying on of hands. It's called an impartation. So, Father, we're, we're asking for the attributes of Jesus that were in James, the meekness, the humility, the hunger, the willing to serve, the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. We're asking for you to give that to us. We want to be elevated. We, we want to be that aspect of Jesus who was meek and gentle and kind and very much a pragmatic servant. We welcome that anointing, that color band of the Holy Spirit, that manifestation of Jesus expanded in us, Lord, to where we have a church full of people that are fully alive, animated by the Spirit, and are willing to serve, willing to serve in practical and spiritual ways. We welcome that anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, so we're going to just carve out a little bit of time, um, carve out 15, maybe 20, 20 minutes max, just to create space for people to come and share, reflect on, celebrate, honor James. Um, ask that you'd keep it short um, so that uh, other people have space as well. And so this is open mic. So I want to, and, and it might be just in the, for the sake of time, it might be more helpful to maybe create a little bit of a line so we're not just kind of standing here waiting for the next person to share. So Tim is going to start us out. And then if, there's, if you'd like to, just uh, come up here. And uh, we'll just spend some time sharing about James. All right, Brett, thanks. Ooh. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what's already been said, that I was one of those who received when he walked into the room multiple times. It was consistent, and it was impactful. And... Um, you know, one of the things that was really beautiful about James was, and it was mentioned before, but his faithfulness. He had an unwavering faith that God was good. And it informed his every action, his every word. And so for me, that was something that resonated with me. And he spoke that over me. He spoke that we were kindred spirits in that way and again there was just a way about James where he cut through like he bypassed a lot of the things the standards the cultural norms the whatever it might be he just went past it and just went straight to identity he just went straight to this is who you are and this is what he's calling you into and for me, it was just like, I remember one Sunday, he came up to me and he's just like, the Lord has put something in your heart to share. I don't know what it is, but you're going to share it. And then literally the, the night before he passed away, we were doing a men's equipping meeting. And afterwards, he and I connected right over there. And he reemphasized that same thing, that same message of the Lord has put something in your heart to share and you're going to share it, and I just want you to know that he's calling you into humility within that. Um, just quickly, another story. Um, he came up to me one time and was like, hey, the Lord told me that he wants me to give you something. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what that means. Um, and so he literally, like, for several weeks, he kept saying, the Lord has something to give to you, and I'm going to give it to you. And I'm, I, he, he didn't want to tell me what it was. And it was just like, it was just like this vague mysticism, right? Um, and eventually, he's like, here, this is what I have for you. And it was a coat. 
it was it was literally just a, a a beautiful fleece coat that was he didn't need it didn't have a use for it but was really excited to give it to me and um he gave a coat to Jamie as well my wife and as we received that my wife was like this is a mantle and so literally like as he is giving us these coats, we receive also just a prayer from him to receive that mantle. And so I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means, but it was significant in that the mantle of God is good, the mantle of he is faithful no matter where we are, what we're doing, what he calls us to, it's like, this is a great ministry. Don't leave it. No, it's like, he calls me over here. Okay, and then you hop over here, and then you hop over there because it's God is good, and he has the bigger picture. He has the bigger perspective. And um, and so for me to receive that uh, is really was a, just a tremendously special gift. And when I heard that he had passed the night after, um, it was heart-wrenching, but at the same time, there was an int- an incredible sense of peace because I knew that God had used him exactly how he needed him and he was where he needed to be when he needed to be. And there was just such shalom really resting on my heart, even though I had hopes and dreams of mentoring under him and wanting more, (laughs) but the Lord knew that he had given what he needed to. And so that was um, just really a special moment for me. Um, So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I didn't know Tim as well. I mean, James as well. I had just come to the church and met Yenny and James. And that very day um, I met him, he walked up to me and he had a word for me. And he looked at me and he was very humble and he didn't want to just jump right in. So he asked me, he asked permission. He says, can I give you a word from the Lord? And I said, oh, absolutely. I'd be honored. And he shared something that I really needed to hear that day. It truly did help me get me set on course for what God was calling me to, to join this church for some things that he was putting in my heart to do. And that confirmation came as James stood there before me and spoke those words over me. And I will never forget what he spoke to me. So then after he passed, I was in my backyard and I was praying outside, just asking the Lord, you know, about Yenny. I was so concerned for her. And he kept telling me, she's going to be fine. She's going to do great. She's just an amazing woman of God. So Elaine, don't go there with all that grief and pain. So instead I said, okay, well, what are you saying? And all of a sudden the Lord told me, James is speaking to you right now from heaven. He says, and it's just right there in the word. And I opened my Bible to James 1, 27. And it says this. True spiritual sp- spirituality that ha- is pure in the eyes of our Father God is to make a difference in the lives of the orphans and the widows <laughs> in their troubles and in I can hardly see to read but he's telling us you guys from heaven to continue to be concerned about the widows and the orphans because that was what he did and that was his heart and he fulfilled that and I just felt so honored because I didn't know him that well but I knew him in the spirit and we located in the spirit, and there it was for him to give me that message. And I knew that I had to bring it before the church and share that word. So, guys, remember, James did send us another message uh, from heaven. So and there it is, and it is First, first James um, 27. So, God bless you. So, I didn't know uh, James very much was around him for a period of time. And then uh, Tim started inviting my wife and I to join a 
house group. And it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. It kind of sucks a little. Um, it's really hard. Um, it's got a lot to give. And uh, I just don't know if, but yeah, I was just going, I don't know. I don't know. And then he came. Came to my house and said, uh, James and Yinny are going to go lead the group with me. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I need. And it, it's really hard to explain what, um, it's hard to put into words what about James and Yinny is so drawing to me. Um, but I know it, it was very deep and very beautiful, and very serving, and uh, I, it was very safe, yeah. yeah, and I know because of their history of serving in the mission field, I, I, I felt like I could trust you with things from my life, and then I found out uh, that James was working for Travis, whom I worked for for seven years, and working on the same things, and um, it's like it just kind of felt like it just got deeper and deeper, and uh, I mean, I remember Josh and I praying with James a couple times at that group, and his, um, I got three weeks with him in that group. And that was, uh, definitely felt like not enough. Yeah, I felt like I really wanted a lot more of James than that. Um, yeah. Um, I'm Larry Nadler. I met James two years ago at Tribal. We kind of bonded and he just kept asking me questions about Laramie, you know, and I kept thinking not too many people asked me anything about Laramie. <laughs> but he did say to me, he says, well, I, I think the Lord is telling me to come here. And I just looked at him, and I said, well, James, if the Lord told you to come here, he'll bless you. So we helped him find a, he called, he went back, and he called, and he said, we're moving to Laramie. He says, can you, you got to find me a house. <laughs> Mar Mary Arnold says, you can do anything. Well... There's not many houses in Laramie, and we'd call him. We found a little two-bedroom in West Laramie, and he says, has it got a garage? I says, it's got a small garage. He says, I don't need it. He says, I got four wheels, trucks, cars, and I need a little bigger house. And I said, well, we'll see. <laughs> Finally, one day, Diana Sebeck said, well, talk to the neighbor. They're selling their house, and they told us about a house across the street. So we go over there, and... Guy said he's going to rent it. So we call him. I'm pretty excited. Jim says, well, is it big enough? I says, I think it's big enough. I didn't realize how much furniture he had. but <laughs> So anyway, he told me a bunch of stories about he was a mover and all this. And they got here and he got moved in. And so I said to him, I said, well, James, I'm, I'm leaving. Can you help me pack? You've moved furniture. So he came over the day we we're moving, and he, he got in the back of my truck, and we took enough clothes for 10 years and <laughs> handing barbells and golf clubs, and he kept saying, where are we going to put all these clothes? I said, well, we got a back seat. So when we we're done, he said, uh, well, how long are you going to be gone? I said, well, just a little while. He said, what's a little while, Nadler? I said, eight months. And he looked at me, and I told him, and he, I thought he was going to, he was a little upset because I'd he didn't know too many people. I says, well, I, uh, I'll be back. And he'd taken my battery out, talking about old farts. <laughs> I, could, I could undo it, but I couldn't, I don't have enough strength. So he took it out, but I said, don't forget, I'll be back, and you can put it in. So I called him a week before we got back, and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll put it in. 
And I'm watching him. He says, don't rush me, Nadler. I said, I'm not rushing you. He says, I like to work slow. I said, just keep on working then, James. So, so uh, I really kind of felt bad because I didn't get to know him. And I, you know, I really wanted. He was special. I know he had a heart for the Lord. And he loved to clean. And I'd rather clean than eat. But we, we would have... We probably would have been a good team somewhere. But anyway, I, I'll miss him, and I love his wife, and I told her I'd help her any way we could. And I'm so glad you're in Laramie because all these people love you, Annie. Hi, my name's Jesse. Um, I just moved out here about six months ago, so... What I wanted to share about James was something that maybe we've said in different ways, but I think when you when you shared Eric, I was like, no, that I have to, like, he would find me in different places. Um, I would be walking around town. I, I was, like, into, like, working out really intensely, and so I'd be running around town, and he would just stop the car, and he would be like, come on over, and I'm like in the middle of a workout, I'm like, I don't want to, I mean, it's not the time, but I was like, okay, so I would go, and I would like, I would go, and I would, you know, have a vest on, and I'm like, hey, what's up, man, and he's, I just wanted to say I love you, I just want to, you know, I just want to say, see how you're doing, and, and, and stop in the middle of, you know, and I was like, wow, I was like, that's powerful that he found, you know, he would always, he would find me, you know, in different places, and he would see me in different places, and he would call me out, so I just wanted to share that with you. My name's Jim. Um, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to get to know James like many of you here in the room. And, uh, but, you know, it didn't take much to really be impacted by him. And I did have the time in the men's group the night before and a couple of weeks of that. And, uh, but also when we practiced for worship on Sunday mornings, he'd be part of the prayer team. And he'd be over here just, and he'd step up against the wall and he'd be really quiet. And, you know, everybody else, you know, had things to say. But James, he just was, it's just like he was just hanging, waiting to hear what the Lord wanted him to do. Yeah. Right? And uh, fascinating, really. Uh, there was no agenda. He didn't need to say anything. He just was waiting to hear what Jesus wanted him to do. And so, so one time he, he spoke to me. Just I can remember him coming from the door over there. And I just say, how you doing? And good morning and all the formalities. And he said, you know, um, you matter. <laughs> right? So I'm thinking about this lighthouse this morning and trying to make that connection and realizing that, um, you know, all of you matter. And if you think you don't, you know, check in with the Lord because there's going to be people he's going to put in your life like James. They're going to have one minute of interaction and say something like that. They're going to remind you that you're, you know, what you do matters. And see, the thing about the lighthouse here that's so, so fascinating is that it would never work in California because it would fall into the sea. You see a lot of lighthouses on the East Coast because the rocks under them are solid. And they stay for years, some of them for centuries. And for centuries, they give guidance to, to ships that are lost out in the sea. And, and they matter. And it matters that they don't fall. So they have to be built on a strong rock. And so me, you know, that spoke to me so heavily just realizing when he said you matter, it wasn't just like, you know, in a general sense. I had to process that and realize that, you know, in my life, what I do matters. It matters to you guys. It matters to my wife. So in the brokenness of living a life of addiction, right, and, and being a leader in my spirit, but always falling, built on mud in California, 
and falling into the sea and not able to give direction when I wanted to, and I saw the need. The light was shining, but it was buried underwater. Right? And then James comes and says, you matter. Well, the thing is, these things stand for years. And they take the worst weather, as was noted previously, and they take the beating, and, they're, and the thing is, they're right out there on the edge. Okay, so the problem with Christianity right now in, in our country is that we want to be comfortable. And we're afraid to live right out on the edge where the people are hurting. And so, <coughs> so the truth is, um, you matter. Okay, don't forget it. Because if James could teach you anything and you didn't know him like me, you're important. And he wants you to stay on the rock, solid, not fall into the sea. He wants your light to shine. So take a stand. And don't be afraid to get on the edge where the people are hurting. So we'll have Shannon and Gretchen, and then just in your time, we'll have you two be the last. So, yeah, come on up. Jim, you matter to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm speaking of the lighthouse. I used to live on an ocean, and um, just a different context. I would go to the lighthouse in the middle of the night, and I would just sit underneath it. And it was such solace, and it was such peace, and it was absolutely amazing. And the light that would go, and I could see it on the water. And um, it was the only thing that was visible, <laughs> you know, in the middle of the night. Um, so James is extraordinarily strong. Yenny, I do not remember if you were at my house helping me to move. I'm so sorry. You're probably there. But I do remember your husband. He was insanely strong. And I was like, dang. Now that's some help right there. Um, but uh, obviously, he touched the lives of many men, so I'm here representing. Um, when I first met James, uh, I, I just I knew that he had married Yenny, and I knew that he was in Africa, um, and I lived there in, in the past. And, and so I just kind of just jumped right in and talking about travels and talking about living overseas and everything like this. And my best friend's from Denmark. and. And he was so excited, especially to talk about Denmark, because he was so for his wife. Everything about him was for his wife, and he just embraced that. And 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 and, um, and so I was super excited to talk to her. But it took me a couple months to actually talk to her. I just <laughs> had to talk to him every time I came. But um, um, when I was looking for an MKF, and Diana suggested I go to the MKF with uh, James and Yenny. Uh, I was super stoked about it. And then she said, Tim and Janet are leading. And I was like, well, when are they going on sabbatical? And <laughs> just really, really stoked to be able to connect with James and Yenny. Um, and I went and I talked to him. And I said, so are, are you guys doing this? And he said, well, we're praying about it. And I'll be honest, I rolled my eyes. And I said, lovely Christian response. That's great. Everybody just praying about everything. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, being a little cynical. Um, as I got to know him a little bit more and had a few conversations, um, he genuinely, I've known people all over the world thousands and thousands of people. I've met many, many, many people, and I know many people very dearly because I'm an extrovert and a little on the extreme side at times. James genuinely, <laughs> James is the most genuine person I have ever known. When he said that, and I had some more conversations with him, it just really settled in with me. And when I hear everybody talking, it settles in with me anymore, ev even more. He meant it, and everything that he said and everything that he did was more genuine than anybody I know. He is more genuine in his identity, in the confidence of who he is, and the positions and places that he had in other people's life, and his position with the Father and with Jesus. And um, that is the thing that I'm going to remember him 
that and the fact that I need to know his wife more. <laughs> so. so I'm Gretchen. Um, I met James when um, they came to Connections. And um, I really didn't know him all that well outside of church and connections. And when Yenny invited my husband and I to dinner three days before he passed away, we almost said no. Um, I almost said no because my husband is very introverted. And I'm glad that we said yes. Um, because I sat across the table. I was sitting next to, to Yenny, and we had our little girl talk over on this side, and James and Steve had a little talk on the other side. And I watched James interact with my husband, and um, he was so, like everybody else has said, he's genuine. He was genuine. He listened, and he really... Um, made my husband feel like he did matter. And he did um, have men's group on Sunday. Um, and so I did, see J I did see James that morning on Sunday. And then my husband also saw him that night at men's group. And I'm just glad we didn't say no. So... With everyone, if you feel like saying no, think again, it might be your last. And you'll regret it. You'll regret it. So thank you again, Yenny, for, for including us in your life and having hamburgers with us. All right, we're going to have Yenny come on up. So, yeah, Yenny, come on up. Yeah. Give me a quick hug. Yenny, so glad you're here. Wow. I really don't know what to say. Um so many beautiful things has been said and um and i know that's a lot more that could have been said um but before i i share i just there's a few people i'd like to say thank you to some people have come really far jane's sisters prudence and joyce and brother-in-law gary um prudence is from california and uh joyce and gary from nevada and um and we had the opportunity to spend yesterday together. And uh, I think it's okay to say it's the first time I met you, but we had a beautiful time together. It was absolutely wonderful. Then we have Brian and Connie from South Dakota. <laughs> I met you the first time in 2008 in Wisconsin. And um, I think I shared with Tim not so long ago that the first time I had a conversation with you, it was a re restaurant in in, uh, in Little Richard Center. And James, he went to the bathroom and when he came back, I was sitting and crying <laughs> because of whatever it was, <coughs> excuse me, that you'd said to me. And I can't remember what it was today, but it touched my heart. And, um, and James just, he, he just loved you very much, both of you. Um, we have people coming from all over the place. Um, and, and I'm, just, I'm just really, really grateful for all of you wanting to make this trip coming. Oh, where are you? There you are, Rob. Yes. <laughs> um, um, but I also want to say thank you to, to certain people here within the church. Because James went to work and didn't come home. But the people
på her. Det må jeg have mere om. The love that I have experienced. I, I don't even know how to say thank you. Tim and Janet. You're like a mom and dad. You just took that role. My parents can't be here for good reasons. Um, but you took over that role. <coughs> And I feel so loved. I feel so connected to all of you. Eva just dropping by is like, I'm supposed to come and give you a hug today. So she would. <laughs> you know, if food, food would come to me. Or, my gosh, Laura, the many walks we've done. It's, it's been amazing. And Nathan, I just want to thank you for being there. You were there. It means the world to me. So, yes, so we got that out of the way. So thank you, all of you, all of you, for the different parts that you have played over these, these past weeks. Um, so um, I got five pages, but it's in really big writing, so <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, so how do you sum up the life of James? It's, it's, it's been the hardest thing for me to do because I was looking online. How do you do eulogies? I don't know. We don't do this in Denmark like this. So please spare, spare with me or bear with me. Sorry. And, um, and so I was looking and I was like, oh, five minutes is good. I'm like, five minutes. I was like, this is James. I can't do five, five minutes with James. It's not, it's not possible. The life he's lived, it's just been so full. Um, so, but I will try and be gentle with you guys. So, I met James in April of 2007 in Mozambique. So, it's 2007. <laughs> um, uh, and we were both new missionaries to Africa. Um, he arrived a couple of months before me. So, it, as new missionaries, we started sharing notes. Because it's, it's a different life. You've got questions, you've got concerns, and it's not easy. And Mozambique has a lot of things that's not easy about it. So um, so very quickly we started talking. And um, after a few weeks when, uh, from when I first met him, we had our first date in the visitor's kitchen. <laughs> very romantic. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and I just want to say, and there's like 40 visitors, okay? <laughs> so, um, and we had beans and rice from the kitchen, this from the sender's kitchen. Yes. And uh, we overstayed the curfew by a couple of four hours. So here I just want to say sorry, Papa Steve, if you're, if you're listening. And Nancy Anderson, I promise we were really, really quiet. So, yeah. Anyhow. So that was how I started my journey with James, and that's all it took. That night I realized there was something different about James. With the result, and this is really, really the very, very short story, um, but the, with the result of us getting married a year and a half later. When I met James, I wasn't really looking for a husband. I actually thought it was going to be me and God to eternity. I didn't need the hassle. I didn't need the drama. So I was like, Lord, had enough. You and me, we're doing good. No, I don't need the distraction. God had another, another thought. I had made a couple of stipulations in case God had someone for me. So I had said, I got two stipulations and one request. One, the first one, God is first in his life. I'm not playing games anymore. And um, second of all, he needed to be clear on mission because I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a missionary. The third one, which is my, my favorite, <laughs> uh, is what that if it wasn't too much trouble, that whoever he had for me, that he would be left-handed. Because don't ask me why, but I actually find that quite attractive. <laughs> And so, um, well, I didn't have to ask the question where he stood on mission. I met him in the mission field, so that was easy. 
And his idea of getting to know each other, oh boy, um, it was let's pray together and let's talk about who God is in our lives. That was our dates, and it took him weeks before he kissed me. <laughs> I was getting a little impatient, but anyhow. So, but I was like, God, when is it going to happen? And so, um, and he was left-handed. So there you go. Yes. See, first page. So, um... James was raised in California, and uh, he first came to Wisconsin at 17 to go to Bible College in Waukesha, New Tribes Bible Institute. But his one sister <laughs> met someone, and I got the story yesterday, <laughs> met someone from Little Town Christian Center. <laughs> and so after Bible College, that was kind of like, I'm going to go there because it made it all natural. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Just started it. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's actually on purpose. I haven't had anything up yet. Um, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, James was, and we've heard many stories about this, he was a very gifted man in many, many different areas of his life. Um, but I think he's kind of tried anything that's out there, from a cheesemaker in Wisconsin to a missionary <laughs> in Africa. Yeah. So it's like, it, it didn't really matter. He had, oh, yeah, 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 I know how you do this. I know. And I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, um, he was a merchant marine engineer for 11 years uh, out of Washington. Sorry, uh, Seattle, Washington, right? And um, and he also one another thing that he re another job he really liked was working for North American Van Lines. So he moved, like he would say, it, very wealthy people from coast to coast. Um, he was a lover of motorcycles, and had been doing motocrossing for many many years. Um, so I think in many ways you could categorize James as a man's man. I know that might not be popular today, but I loved that about him. Um, he did not have, we heard about this a couple of times, he did not have an easy start in life, which resulted in an adoption at the age of 12. And because of that, he carried a lot of wounds. And even in our early marriage, there was a lot of, there was still a lot left. Because until you get close to another person, some things don't manifest, but it did. So we had a couple of tough years in the beginning, um, and also we had culture difference that we had to deal with, and, um, and then also we were not babies when we got married. I was in my 30s, and James had just turned 40. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, so we had, we had a few things ahead of us. Um, but with my stubbornness and James's constant desire to be the husband and man that he knew God wanted him to be, it, we became a very strong and united couple. And the first step in that process was when he was able to forgive his birth mother. That was, it unlocked and unlocked. And over the years, he was able to establish a healthy and, rela and stable relationship with her. And we would go to Kentucky quite often where she lived. Um, so here you have this tough man who can fix just about anything. He would, he would never say what he really could because he was actually really humble about what he was able to. I think Travis was like, well, you keep saying you're not a mechanic. But you do all the mechanical stuff. <laughs> He's like, yeah, because that's what he did. He just, I don't know. He, I don't know. He understood it in an incredible way. Um, but you have this man who could fix. And then he ended up going to an orphanage in the middle of Africa. 
which leads me to another of his passions, the vulnerable, especially the children. He had been a vulnerable fatherless child himself, and so he understood their pain and rejection. He wanted to help and serve these children with his gifts. Not only did he do that, but he connected with them in a way that I envied. James was not linguistically gifted, but it didn't matter to him. He communicated and connected with them, with, with kids, not only the kids, but all the people, um, without using language. Um, and they loved him very much. He was known in Mozambique as Petey Petey, <laughs> which is hot peppers. James loved hot peppers. Part of his growing up, I mean, he would eat them like, not quite right. He would have it just about anything except from ice cream, I think. But otherwise, he would eat lots of hot peppers. And so what he would do when he first came to the center, he would, he would sit and eat with the children. So we had about 350 kids. So he would sit and eat with the children and have hot peppers in his rice and beans, which was the most staple food there, and share it. And so the kids, they called him Petey Petey. It was not Manu James, it was Petey Petey. And um, um, the nursery and the baby house was his priority. His daily goal was to visit them at least once a day. Tracy Williams, who's still there, she's from England, she's been there for many, many years. She will testify to that, and I'm sure she's listening in at some point. Oh my gosh. The toddlers, the little toddlers, would be like this staggering in the sand. Mozambique is a big sand pit for you that you don't know. But they would be staggering like this coming out from the baby house. And you would see James from afar. And he'd go, beady, 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 beady. <laughs> it was just the cutest thing you can imagine. I just, and everybody that would notice that, they would love it. They just, they loved it. Um... James would always respond to the children with love and genuine interest. He knew them all, 350. Maybe he didn't know them by name, but he knew them. He recognized them, and they knew that. He also enjoyed mentoring the staff that ended up being under him, and the young boys that showed interest in learning maintenance skills and some of the pictures will show you that he's trying to he's making a a walker for a little disabled girl um, James would often say that we won't be remembered by how we begin but how we leave whether it's a position job or life James you will re be remembered for the impact that you had in so many lives. You were a father to the fatherless. You understood who your neighbor was, and we heard some testimonies about that. And would often start your day by asking, God, who, you should, who should I be an encouragement to today? You loved people so well. And your desire was to see people succeed and become the best version of themselves and be free of their past, like yourself. You never gave up on anybody. As a mentor at Axe Academy in Denmark, which is my Bible college, he would always be given the tough cases to mentor. <laughs> <coughs> you were able to see people the way God saw them. You will be remembered by how you loved your father in heaven. You never wanted to do anything without him. You moved when he told you to and stayed when he asked you to stay. And that was not always without a cost. You will be remembered for having a willing heart to always be teachable. You were humble and yet a wise man. These are some of the reasons why I fell in love with you. 
I have learned so much by watching how you lived your life with your father. You may not have known a good father on earth, but your life was a testament to your relationship with your heavenly father, something I always admired. But to me, the most important of all, you will be remembered for being a husband. My husband, my companion, my provider, my friend and partner in the most beautiful life that I could have asked for. I loved being your wife. When you would introduce me to someone saying, and I'm going to give an example, Tim and Janet, I'd like you to meet my wife, Mimi. It made me feel larger than life. I was honored to have that title and recognition as your wife. We have shared life on three continents and several countries. And all the memories and experiences that we built together are not just in my memory. I hate it because we had a special life and I wanted more. I never doubted your priority towards me. You took your responsibility as a husband very seriously. <clears throat> God had taught you that. I remember one day mm, when you came home from work. And it was clear that you had had a tough day. But instead of taking it out on me, you said, do you know what the worst part of my day is? I was like, no, it's coming home to you. Or when you introduced progressive birthday, meaning you had a gift for me every day during the week leading up to my birthday. <laughs> Planning treasure hunts for my birthdays. Your love language was to give gifts and serve others. James, you lived a full and rich life. time has come for me to say goodbye. <laughs> if I could stall the time, I would. I would make time stand still so I could hold on to you a little while longer. I miss you. And I will miss all the little goofy things about you. <laughs> the things that made us, us. I will miss you singing to me. You had a beautiful voice. On our road trips, we would sing all the time to the dismay of Blue, which is our dog. <laughs> I miss your hands. They were beautiful, capable, strong, warm, and gentle. Last time I touched them, they were cold and distant. Telling me that you were not able to comfort me. And I'll end this with just telling a little story from Memorial Day one week before. We were hiking out at Beetleby, just along the main road. And you guys that are very familiar with the area out there, you will probably know the big, the wide road up there. And we were just going to look at the area, find good camping spots and stuff like that, because that's what we wanted to do. And uh, there's an area that has a really large rock. And you can kind of go in the back, and then you have the backdrop of the mountains. And we could see people climbing, 
climbing the mountains. And James was like thinking about back home in California. <laughs> and he said, he turned around and he said, it's like I have come home. This reminds me of California. He used to rock climb. <laughs> it was like, he's like, it's like I have come home. And so Brenda and Rob, I had dinner with them a couple of weeks ago, and they gave me this. Home. So the O is Wyoming. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you, James, for letting me share your life with you. I thought we would have many more years together. My first thought was, how am I going to do this without you? But I'm also realizing in many ways, you have shown me how to do it. And I know you will be okay. One of your favorite songs was, I can only imagine thy mercy me. Well, my darling, you don't have to imagine anymore. I'm sure it's far better than what our imagination can produce. So, um, I was hoping that we maybe could all stand and just say the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. Wow, that was awesome. We're going we're gonna to celebrate James' life with a reception here in just a few minutes. You're all invited. We have a lot of delicious food. We want you to stay for that. Before we uh, end, I've asked Yenny for her permission to um, pray over her. And uh, she's transitioning now as she's uh, bringing some degree of, I'm not even going to use the word, uh, she just did what she just did, and um, we are also recognizing that there's a significant call in her life. Uh, she, she came to Janet and I and said, I, I want to serve and need to serve. I'm called to serve for the nations. I'm called to serve in this tribe, this spiritual family. And I said, well, after I picked myself up off the floor, I said, thank you, Yenny. We have serious need for help in a lot of areas and she goes whatever it is I'll tackle it and so it's administrative websites none of these things are you know she's a nurse by trade and but she goes if that's what we need if we need help in communication I will help and so she's she's uh, partnered with Janet and I as well as this local church to be a servant here and she has a call on her life uh, as a missionary and we are we are now developing training, training uh, experiences for leaders around the country and eventually around the world and then here in Laramie. And Yenny is the, is the hub of the communication. She's just got her own Zoom account, and she's going to be the administrator of uh, training that's going to be going on while we're on sabbatical for this next year. So in other words, she's going to be working for Derek Cook, but she's also wants to work for us, and she didn't ask for any compensation or anything like that. But I would love to uh, have you know that she's on the ministry team of Rock International, a rock tribe. And she's here in a local way as a member of this church to serve as well. So if you would like to provide some support ongoing for her mission's calling, we're setting the stage, I believe, for some amazing content and training that will go around the world in due time. So if you'd like to support her, you can you can make a check out or you can jump online. We can show you easy ways to do Zelle pay or checks or anything. It's very simple. 
we'll give you a, a Yenny's address if you want to send that support to her, and then she will will deposit it in the Rock International account. She'll have a special account, and it will go to her. So you can just write the check, uh, Rock Tribe. That will work. And then in the memo, just put JC for Jesus Christ. I mean, J Jenny Cannon. <laughs> Yenny Cannon. Okay, so... Yeni, if you'll come up here, I would like us as a family to gather around you right now. This is a big deal, and so would you like a chair or would you want to stay standing? You can stand. Okay, all of you guys want to come on up. We're going to gather around Josh, Amy, Bob, and Diana. Yeah, pretty much everybody here. It's important that you participate. And those of you who are... Guests, don't consider yourself guests. Consider yourself part of this family right now. And um, and we're just gonna we're not gonna go long, but we're just gonna we're just gonna wait on the Lord now just a minute. Just breathe and say, Jesus, do you have a word or a picture for me to, sh to release to Yenny as she enters into a new season, a new season of her life? We ask you to speak to her now, and we're recording this, and so we won't go long. I'm getting a word catalyst. I hear the Lord just saying, and he's setting you up to be a catalyst to bring the uh, message of the kingdom uh, and, and the certain things that God has given us uniquely to share with the nations, you're going to be a catalyst for a move of God's spirit in the nations. I'm hearing the word catalyst. Lord, I release that word to you, to Yenny, and on your behalf. Protect her. And just uh, along those lines, Yenny, I was also getting the word mother of nations. Mm. And I really, I, I just had a picture of an eagle flying. And I was just immediately reminded that you will mount up on wings like eagles. And, and we just, um, just stand with you and affirm you. Um, it's okay to soar, and it's okay, and it's time to soar. And we just, that you will mount up on wings like eagles. And we just um, want to pray a special just blessing right now. We just, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for this incredible um, celebration of life. And we thank you for the opportunity to carry on a life well lived right now. And that Yinny uh, gets to lead the charge, and we 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 get to follow that, and we just we were so grateful, and we release honor to you, Yinny. Mm. We want to honor you, that you are a woman that holds authority in the kingdom realm, that you've been given keys to the kingdom, and you're a woman that walks in authority, and we just we release honor, and we say no ceilings. Um, no ceilings, no boundaries, no, it just, you, you, you rise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is going to rise on you. See the darkness that surrounds you, but rise and shine. Because his glory is all over you. And so right now, we just command the glory of God to come and just wrap around Yinny. Wrap around. It's time to rise and shine because his glory is surrounding you. We declare this. It's a season of rising, shining, and letting the glory of God wrap around you in Jesus' name. And Father God, I just want to thank you for Yenny and James and them coming here. And I... Um, 
just am really, it's being impressed upon my spirit that they came here redefining our relationship with you, redefining what it means to live for the kingdom. And I just feel a huge impression upon my heart <laughs> that um, Yeni is here and the gift um, is to redefine what it means to be an orphan and a widow. I think, I, I mean, I'm not a big theologian, but just the perspective of of what an orphan is and what a widow is, and I, I think they're seen as potentially weak. And as we've seen already, Yenny and Mary Arnold, um, widows are strong. And so we just partner, Father God, with your heart for the orphan and for the widow. And we just... We just receive you, Yenny. We receive you. And the strength of the Lion of Judah inside of you. And we just thank you. We just thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for James. And thank you, Father, for Yenny. And the way you set her up, James just like you wanted to set the rest of us up. That was just very important to you. Just thank you. Um, Yenny, I was, you know, just filled with emotion for, and, and so many things have been said, but what really impressed me now is, is God sent you here. <laughs> and the assignment is not a trip. not over his word still goes forward and you're here may we honor your presence honor what you have to to add to this body and may we all come together in unity and go forward but God sent you Yenny <laughs> this one bothered me because I after your first song, I was in, as I was saying, that was a beautiful song and so appropriate. And um, after it was over, I saw him step in and he took your jaw and he looked at you. He kissed you on the cheek, and this was all in the spirit. And he kissed you on the cheek. And he said, you're going to be okay. He had your jaw. He was looking into your, he was looking into your eyes. And even though he couldn't, you can't see him, he sees you. And, and he was just saying, you're going to be okay. And that this is the beginning. And, and, I, and I also, um, of great things, of great things, because your God is good. And, and you've got a great future before you. And to not look behind, but to look forward. And he said, there's, there's inside of you, there's a nurse for a reason. You like to fix people. You like to help people, you know. And, and that's, that's um, who you are. That's how God created you to be. There's a new beginning of us submitting to you as a mother, because I got a mother also, um, and that um, it's new beginnings to help people to truly walk out who they are, who they were created to be. And so I'm excited for you in this new journey. So... <clears throat> As much as you've lost something in the natural, what I'm hearing, Yenny, is that a big space in the spirit realm has been opened up for you. And that's really true for this whole body. With Tim and Janet leaving, they're actually creating space for the people here to step into the roles that they're destined to. And you have a role before you. And what I hear the Lord saying is explore the space, Yenny. Explore the space. Because... As you said in your own remarks, James taught you how to live, and now you're going to get to take those things and actually do them. And so my encouragement to you is to not put any limitations on who you are or what you are, 
but to explore the many things that the Lord has created you to be. And lots of them are going to be new and, and different, but they will be exciting because there are things that he wants to express through you that he couldn't have expressed if James was still here because you would have always deferred to him. But the time has now come for you to be his daughter, the daughter of the Most High God, the same lover of James' soul as the lover of your soul. And now you're going to learn that the lover, that James is the same soul, the uh, same Lord that loved James's soul is going to love your soul in a deeper and more, more profound way. And it's going to enable you to express that love in, only, in a unique way that only you could do so. It's been a joy passing my torch to you. You are creative, and you've shown that in your beadwork. So be creative with what I've shown you. You've got it. You know it. And I love you. Thanks for spending time with me. My sweet, sweet friend. <laughs> You've been such a blessing to me from the moment you walked in the door. I see your wings and I see what God is doing. He is the wings under your, the wind under your wings. The Holy Spirit knows you and is ready to guide you and make you fly. You are going to fly. Oh, you are going to fly. I see that in the spiritual so much. And James is so proud of you. And James is so proud of you. He's let you go for us. And we are so blessed to have you. Well, Father, thank you for this amazing time, for this spiritual family, and that you've given Yenny to us and us to Yenny. You said we belong to you, Yenny. You belong to us. Thank you. We're so honored by this deep, profound connection. And we do pray for protection over Yenny's heart, that you would uh, give her comfort that only you can bring, that you protect her mind and heart to walk in the spirit 24-7, 365. The Lord, the, uh, the realm of heaven opens up to her like none before. Dispatch angels to camp around her, Lord, and her precious dog, Blue. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless her in every conceivable way, body, soul, spirit. And we thank you for all those that have loved her, that are watching here today. We bless them as well. Her parents, in a special way, for the way they loved her and raised her. And so we thank you now for this beautiful time today, Lord. And we know it's just the launching pad into some amazing, amazing life. And we thank you for the food that we're about to enjoy and the fellowship we're going to enter into. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus.